So I'm very excited today to be joined again uh, by Dr. Miriam Mikitsky, which we usually shorten to Dr. Miriam. And she's very generously offered her time to help go through uh, more of the lab markers, which are very common that you know, you'll probably get in most cases from your doctor. These are all very standard lab markers that we've talked about so far. And these are very important. Uh, and often misunderstood. So I'm very glad to have uh, Dr. Miriam here to help us clarify them. Thank you, Dr. Miriam. Uh, thank you for having me again. And yes, very excited to continue our discussion and hopefully help people understand their test results. And so just to clarify, in case you didn't see the previous episode, what we're doing here, we're going through and we're looking at, first of all, what are the optimal levels and we're specifically doing that for people who have maybe told by a doctor that everything is fine but maybe it's, you know, not emergency, but still very far from ideal. And so we're going to clarify that for people. And on the other side, some people are doing tests themselves and they've never had a doctor look at them. And so we want to give people guidance on what kind of levels are concerning enough that you definitely should take them to a doctor. So we're going to go for what is optimal and what is actually worrying enough you should see a doctor. That's the crucial things that the reference ranges often don't really make clear for you. So that's what we're going to do today. And hopefully, if we have time, we're going to go through liver enzymes. We're going to go through uh, pancreas function, which is mainly to do with blood sugar, but there might be a couple of other bits we talk about as well. And we're going to look at cholesterol. We're at least going to do those, and we might do a couple more if we have time. Uh, so I'm very excited. And I know you were... Um, what's the word, more enthusiastic about doing these markers today, uh, Dr. Miriam, because uh, I think you said these are things that you check more regularly. So um, let's start with uh, liver enzymes. Do you want to talk? Um, yeah, just before we get into the individual ones. So my understanding of liver enzymes is often a person's liver has to be pretty bad before it will actually show up in any kind of uh, any kind of outside reference range results. Is that accurate or actually not? Yes, I mean, I would say it is pretty accurate. Um, I think the difference is that actually in, I would say more in conventional medicine, most doctors don't really worry unless your liver enzymes are you know, three to four times the limit. Uh, and even, you know, certain medications that we know that can affect your liver enzymes, usually doctors aren't too worried and they sort of Think, you know, are looking more at the time scale that, okay, you know, if we think it was this cause, then things should return to normal within a couple of weeks. So generally, I would say that, um, and we'll talk about this in more detail, because in functional medicine, I think we consider any elevation a problem. Um, but there are sort of different, different times when we're you know, a bit worried about the mechanism, different times where we like are, you know, reasonably okay with higher numbers, but we'll, you know, we'll get into all of that. Okay, fantastic. Um, and I know a lot of people watching this currently anyway, my audience has quite a lot of men compared to what's typical for a health podcast. And so they may be monitoring this, especially if they are using any kind of uh, testosterone support or something like that. That's often something that can elevate uh, liver hormones. So if it's relevant to talk about that, then you know, feel free to uh, add that as well. But let's start with the first one on my list, if that's okay. So um, the first one that I see here is bilirubin, which uh, I've been told is related to bile. That's why it sounds similar. I don't know if that's accurate. In fact, uh, maybe we can start with bilirubin, but can we explain what the liver markers are? Um, like, uh, how, how does measuring the blood tell us how the liver is doing? If we could start with something like as basic as that. Sure. I mean, um, when you say, when I hear the word liver markers, kind of the first thing I usually think about are um, kind of AST, ALT, and GGT. Those are probably the three most common on, on the blood tests. Um, uh, and generally, I mean, I'll, I'll get into bilirubin in just a moment, but uh, generally what we're measuring are, all of those are enzymes that um, basically when they are uh, released, it's a sign that the liver cells have been damaged and those enzymes are sort of leaking out into the bloodstream. So basically it's, it's, it's kind of a sign that those cells are being damaged and something is damaging um, the liver, um, whether that's a viral thing, toxin, um, and, and, and so forth. Um, um, when you asked about um, bilirubin, bilirubin itself is a waste product 
um, that is uh, you know, produced by the, the breakdown of, um, of red blood cells. Um, and that process sort of happens in the liver. Um, but it can, you know, high, it, when bilirubin is high, uh, you, you have to sort of break it down to figure out if the cause is, um, you know, if, if it has to do with liver dysfunction or if it has to do with biliary tract dysfunction. So that one's, a, I would say, a little bit more, more complicated, um, um, you know, but uh, both very, very important. And bilirubin causes the yellow color, and they, they often check for bilirubin in the urine as well, right? Not just the blood. Um, I guess it's the same principle if it's leaking out of the, the liver and the gall better, then it's, that's not good. Exactly. And also, if, um, um, if the, uh, basically, if, the, if that bilirubin is very high, um, that means either the liver is struggling to process it or... Um, you may have something like a systemic like anemia, like a hemolytic anemia, where um, the red blood cells are being broken down too fast. Um, or there might be a bit of a blockage where essentially there's more of an issue with your gallbladder or bile duct. So that whole access could be, um, you know, could be, could be abnormal. So that could be things like gallstones. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And it's usually Wait. broken down. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, or even just cholestasis where it's not moving properly. Exactly, and you generally you, it, you you typically get a total bilirubin, a conjugated bilirubin, or an unconjugated bilirubin. Um, meaning, and that can kind of help you deduce where the issue is. Um, oh. in terms of like, yeah. How? Please, please uh, elaborate for people who do have those results. <laughs> the way that you you know bilirubin itself is a waste product, so you're trying to eliminate it, and part of that the process of eliminating it is conjugating it um, and that uh, so if you have conjugated uh, bilirubin that that sort of means that the issue is more with the bile ducts and kind of further downstream whereas if it's unconjugated it's more likely to be um, related to liver and the kind of the uh, before before the bilirubin is acted on for detoxification purposes Interesting. Okay, so it's whether the liver is functioning correctly versus whether the bile ducts are blocked. Yes. So, for example, the um, uh, you know, for example, the uh, if it's if it's high unconjugated, you're more likely to have a liver issue. Unconjugated, you're more likely to have. Or sorry, unconjugated a liver issue. Conjugated more a bile duct issue. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Which would include the gallbladder, maybe. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Well, awesome. Let's go to the, uh, as you said, more uh, typical ones. So there's uh, ALT, which is uh, alanine transferase. Can we start with that one? Yes. So that one is a uh, that one is a liver enzyme um, that. Uh, well, to be fair, with um, with ALT, um, that is predominantly a liver enzyme, um, and when um, Basically, again, when it is released into the bloodstream, that's a sign of liver damage. Um, yeah. And that liver damage, uh, what's it usually caused by? So it's more commonly caused by um, things like hep viral hepatitis, um, more so, um, uh, you know, certain certain toxins. Um, you know, but generally um, less so. Uh, how did I say this? So yeah, the first thing I think of with ALT is uh, something that's toxic, um, toxic to the liver or viral or autoimmune, like an autoimmune hepatitis. Um, those could be signs of ALT increase, um, as opposed to AST, which um, we'll get into. But that that's more kind of specific for alcohol and other toxins. Okay. Um, so ALT is more viral toxins, although it could be several things, and AST is more alcohol toxins, although it could be several things from your experience? Yes, uh, I would say more so not just alcohol, but also um, any kind of environmental toxin, um, heavy metals. Uh, normally, uh, you know, sometimes you'll see both elevated because you can, in a way, they can, they can be interchanged. And I would say that if somebody is, if somebody is just kind of has a sluggish detox, um, 
has sluggish detox pathways, whether that's like genetically through certain genetic SNPs or they've just had to process a lot of toxins in their lifetime. Like for example, someone who uh, maybe has the, the wrong genetic SNPs, then had a period of sort of alcohol overuse, um, is also overweight and has, um, you know, may have e estrogen um, dominance. All of that puts stress on the liver. And so that could be one reason why you might have elevated enzymes. Um, and, you know, I, I would say that normally, um, because when I'm looking at these sort of cases, I'm kind of looking at it as, at a, like a, within a more holistic picture. Um, typically, when you have like your ALT elevated uh, in a Western medical sense, uh, they the idea is okay. Something is something is causing this like breakdown of liver cells, um, but it might be viral. So let's just recheck it in six weeks to see if then the virus has been cleared and then the liver is back to normal. So there's this kind of sense that it will come back to normal in a period of time. Mm. And AST stands for uh, aspartate transferase. So those are both just uh, amino acids, uh, alanine and aspartate, with the word transferase added, So, which I guess makes them enzymes. Um, I, I was wondering, I've only had ALT high once in my blood test results, and it was significantly high. And when I actually thought about it, just before that, I had been having very high doses of alanine at night. I think I was having 20 grams of alanine because uh, someone recommended it for balancing blood sugar throughout the night. Um, so I thought that would be a hell of a coincidence. As soon as I stopped taking the alanine, the, the ALT levels went back to normal again. Uh, is there a chance of that from your understanding? I know it's not the uh, same yeah. thing. Yeah, De definitely. There could have been. I mean, it's one that I don't think a doctor would actually even think about because it's not something that's commonly supplemented. But sure. But of course, I mean, it's a good point because people are taking things like amino acid supplements. And actually, you know, if you have um, if you're eating a lot of proteins or amino acids and you're struggling to break those down, um, then you could be raising your liver enzymes. Um, and I mean, I would say that that yeah, it's common that you can actually have both elevated, but the fact that yours were so specific would suggest that that was probably the cause. Because um, uh, as you can imagine, if you have something affecting the liver, it's likely to affect the liver and then the whole liver, gallbladder, bile duct axis. So there's a good chance, like viruses, for example, I say, oh, we think viral, but a virus can raise both ALT and AST. Um, uh, ALT is supposed to be a bit more specific to the liver, whereas AST um, is still predominantly released by um, hepatocytes or liver cells, but there are um, can also be present in like heart cells, pancreatic cells to lesser degree. So it's the ALT is supposed to be a bit more specific for the liver itself. Okay, so but in either case, it's talking about a breakdown of some kind of organ by the or gland by the sound of it. Yeah, okay. And AST, I just want to bring that up because that's aspartic acid. And I know some guys take large amounts of uh, aspartic acid for testosterone boosting purposes. So again, I guess, hypothetically, that could raise AST potentially. I mean, for those, I would say it's probably worth then coming off that for a period of about six weeks and then getting it checked again. Um, even because, I, like I said, I don't think your GP would necessarily put that two and two together and so and then if you if you come in with a very high ASTLT they're I mean they're they're sort of um they will likely blame it on sort of supplements you're taking or amino acids so if you yourself can kind of deduce that and the levels aren't extremely high then I th it's I, you know, I would say it's still considered safe to come off of it recheck and then if they're still high then seek some support Yes. Yeah, as you say, after six weeks, that should have cleared. Um, I also have another one here, ALP, uh, alkaline phosphatase. Is that one that you uh, test as well? Uh, it's one that commonly um, comes up on, on, on bloods. And it's, um, it is actually, it, it can be um, related to liver damage, but it's, it's also a very non-specific marker because it can also relate to um, can also relate to bone um, demineralization and bone disorders. So you also create alkaline phosphatase in your, like, it is released by your, your bone cells. Um, you know, but that, so that one is, I, you wouldn't necessarily 
think that it's, it's necessarily the liver that's causing the issue. But alkaline phosphatase is an interesting um, enzyme just because it also, uh, it needs, um, it's an enzyme that needs a lot of zinc and magnesium. So for example, if somebody's alkaline phosphatase is low, which um, is not really considered abnormal in in Western, in sort of GP land, usually if it's low, it's just considered like, okay, not a problem. We're worried about being high, but from a more optimal nutrition point of view, if it's low, it could actually be a sign of some zinc or magnesium deficiency. Mm, interesting. Okay. And the last one I have there on the list is GGT, uh, which I believe stands for uh, gamma glutamyl transferase. So you can see the commonality here. They all have transferase in these. So they're all enzymes. Uh, what's that one and why would you pay attention to that one? Um, no, GGT, again, another enzyme um, that is that you find mainly in, kind of in the liver, kidney and pancreas, but it is... Um, it, from our pers um, purposes, it's, it plays a, a big role in the metabolism of glutathione, which is a very important antioxidant for, um, for cellular um, health and protection. Um, but it tends to be released when there's damage to the liver or the bile ducts. And uh, we consider it sort of the most sensitive marker for particularly bile duct issues. Uh, if there's any bile duct blockage or constriction. Um, and it is commonly... Uh, you know, it's one where if it's raised, the, the Western um, Western medical viewpoint is that it must be related to alcohol overuse. But actually, it's one of the most um, sensitive markers for just toxins in general um, and um, one that's actually very important, especially because some of the work you might be doing involving metal detoxification or environmental toxin exposure might not really be recognized but if that's high that's a really good sign that you might be overloaded with these sorts of toxins and that your liver is overloaded specifically right liver and bile ducts so that, that and bile kind ducts. of access yeah exactly okay interesting um just uh like coming from the other perspective so if this is not raised at all does that guarantee that there's no bile duct blockage and that the liver is doing fine and not necessarily. I mean, I would say that when these are elevated, that means that there's proper damage and like those cells are being destroyed. Uh, you can still have, you, know, you can still have problems with um, replenishing glutathione and oxidative stress and not necessarily have elevated enzymes. And I think, um, I, I think that's, that's when, it, you know, when it becomes really difficult because you can, um, you know, people might not be feeling well, like if these, if their liver and bile ducts have been working hard to process things and have undergone quite a bit of damage, um, people might feel um, like they have fatigue. Um, they might really struggle, for example, uh, with any kind of um, toxin exposure. For example, people who really struggle with, um, with alcohol, like if they have, you know, half of a glass of wine and all of a sudden they feel tired, lethargic, um, with headaches, that could already be a sign that those pathways aren't working very well. Mm. Even before the, uh, the enzymes are raised. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, but this is, this is, oh, sorry, just add one more point to that. I mean, I would say that if your liver enzymes are raised, I wouldn't just ignore it and kind of wait for them to come back to normal. I mean, your GP might say that, but that is when you really want to be, um, working with somebody or really being conscious about um have you know having foods that um can you know that can help with that oxidative stress so for example things like bitter vegetables um you know foods rich in antioxidants you don't want to ignore it even though that's kind of what the, the gp might say okay well before we go to uh what are optimal and what are worrying levels um could we just say, um, ha like, as a as a both a medical and also functional medicine doctor, it, when you see someone's liver results, what's the process you go through? You know, do you look at this first, or do you compare this to this? Like, is there any kind of procedure that you you tend to go through? I mean, I would say that I I generally, um, I mean, I I try and match the symptoms, and I would say, like, for example. Um, somebody comes to me and they feel very um, fatigued both with physical energy and mental energy. And if I see a raised liver enzyme count, um, the first thing I would think about, particularly if the ALT is raised, is there has there been any viral um, um, exposure or do they recall you know, having had any um, 
you know, any symptoms of, um, yeah, uh, you know, of, of like fever, those sorts of things. Um, if I see, and I say I look at the ALT, AST first, I mean, I do, of course, ask with, with AST, I think the first thing I think about is also alcohol use. Um, that's sort of what you're taught in medical school, that at high AST, particularly if AST is more than double the ALT, um, we were always taught that you, know, you really should screen for alcohol use. Um, and I still think it's, I mean, it's definitely something I always ask about because um, I think people, you know, underestimate their alcohol intake a lot, um, where, and again, it's about chronic exposure over time. Uh, particularly if there's like a mild elevation of these. So, you know, if somebody's been having, um, let's say, two to three glasses of wine a night, that is actually kind of um, a higher um, amount than, than would be recommended. Um, that, could, that is enough to raise your AST. Um, not necessarily kind of like people who are, um, you know, who, who are having, who are substantially drinking let's say 10, 14 units a night, that, that sort. Um, so I do always screen for that. Uh, I also, um, I pretty quickly zoom then to the GGT because I see a lot of people with um, toxin exposure. And, and you know, that's someone where, uh, something where um, you also then can correlate it with um, gallbladder bile duct issues. So for example, women who have been struggling with their weight or there's a sign of estrogen dominance, and they might be at risk for gallstones. If I see that's high, then I would really want to work on that pathway. Um, I, so those three I really zoom on, and that, because it's sort of a gateway of, um, I, I mean, there are sort of more expansive panels and markers you can do based on that. So for example, ALT is high, you might look into doing a viral panel. Um, um, both AST and ALT are high. You could look at um, some tests that look at your hepatic detox um, uh, pathways, um, like urinary tests to see, like, do you actually conjugate those toxins and get them out in the urine? Um, so, and those are more kind of in the realm of a functional tests rather than what you would get on your standard uh, on your standard um, liver panel. And same for GGT. Obviously, if you're questioning toxin exposure, that's when you'd want to look at toxic metals, um, environmental pollutants, things like benzenes, organophosphates, um, yeah, those sorts of things. Interesting. Uh, so we recently had a guest on who talked about toxic bile theory and, you know, his perspective is that the root cause of most or all chronic diseases is actually this very issue that we're talking about now. Um, so I wonder, uh, obviously, as a medical doctor, I doubt you'd agree with that fully, but do you think that the level of um, the liver being overloaded with toxins is kind of underestimated in terms of its importance in conventional medicine? Uh, I, yeah, I definitely agree with that. And actually, um, there are quite a few um, doctors and also TCM practitioners that I follow who say the same that that's kind of a missing link where a lot of um, doctors aren't looking into that in more detail but you um, you know we are seeing I would say more and more people with liver and kidney disease younger people and we are seeing an increasingly toxic world and um, you know just how we eliminate those toxins from the body is very important and when I say toxins I also mean things like your hormones that you're you know supposed to break down and release um, so you know, even kind of more natural things, you, want, you need a process of clearing them. Likewise, bacteria, uh, mycotoxins, your bile is just very um, instrumental for all of that. Hmm. And he specifically liked to test bile acids in the blood, um, different bile acids to see if they were elevated. Is that something you ever do? Or, and if not, is there something you prefer to do to kind of more fine tune to see if there's an issue? Um, I mean, I, to be honest, I, kind of off the top of my head, I do check for bile acids in the stool um, and looking for kind of bile acid malabsorption and then fat malabsorption. Um, I don't really check it on the bloods. Um, not that I don't sort of not agree with it, but just it's often, you know, the gamut of tests I run uh, and sort of looking at kind of more classic markers, you can often deduce that there would be an issue with bile flow and um, and kind of a 
fake sludgy bile and gallstones. Um, yeah. Is that the ones we just discussed or something else? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's what we discussed. So like things like GGT. Um, and I would say that, you know, there are popular like cleanses that look at dissolving gallstones and trying to improve that access that are a little bit controversial. But I would say that, uh, um, you know, some sort of a program where you're trying to aim for proper bile flow and is instrumental to good health and something that shouldn't be ignored. Hmm. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. So exactly how we achieve proper bar flow is a matter of maybe, a, you know, different approaches, but the fact that it's a good idea, kind of everyone mm -hmm. agrees with who specializes in the liver. <laughs> yeah. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality, affordable supplements that Elwin and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers, but the prices are very affordable. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're really helpful and friendly. And what I love most of all is the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it. I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have for most articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code rejuvenateme for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code rejuvenateme at feelyounger.net. Okay, so... Uh, next, let's go through the different um, optimal and worrying levels for the liver markers we just talked about. So uh, let's start with bilirubin. Um, it looks like on my reference range that there is no such thing as too low in the blood. Uh, is that correct from your point of view? Is it a case of the lower the better or can it be too low? I mean, with your liver markers, uh, generally, if your liver is going into failure and it's not working, you won't release any. So it's not always great if they're too low. But for somebody with a normal, with a generally like normal functioning liver, uh, then y y yeah, there's not really a low mark with bilirubin. It's more you don't want it to be above a certain range. Okay. And at what range is it actually uh, concerning that people should, you know, go and see a GP doctor? Generally, uh, so, you know, the reference range is, you know, we, we, we want it to be somewhere like below 15 moles per liter. It's one where you will see, um, you know, I would say that uh, if you're going sort of double that uh, um, into 30 and or if you see any signs of jaundice, so yellowing in the whites of the eyes or white or yellowing of the skin, then that's a, a big problem. And then you should always go and see your, uh, a doctor uh, but I'm I mean I'm okay if it's sort of 20 and below um, it, the reason why that one I'm a little bit more comfortable with it being slightly higher is that I do see a lot of like toxicity causing high bilirubin and sort of um, gallbladder issues bile duct and often the kind of a conventional GP doesn't really do very much um, and it's really only once that bilirubin really skyrockets that you're worried about things like blockages, um, you know, um, bile stones and things like that. So usually if it's kind of less than 20, I'm generally okay with that. Okay. Uh, and just looking at my past results, I don't think it's ever been as high as that. Uh, so that would make sense. And I guess even if it is above 20, if you don't have any symptoms, is, would, is it still a good idea to go to a doctor or would you, is it kind of... I would I would get it checked out and I would also compare it to um, the other liver markers and also your pancreatic markers. If those are out of range, then we know that there's something that's affecting the whole access. And then, you know, you just that was that's where you would want to ideally see a doctor who could do some imaging or refer you for some imaging um, because you can have, you know, I think things like bile duct cancers are very dangerous and very can be very difficult to detect so i think if you're seeing a problem there especially if it's um you know let's say you know if you have some context for that number to be a little bit higher for example you have been doing a a detox that really focuses on like phase two detoxification and it's slightly elevated that might be okay but then i would try and recheck it a couple of weeks later if it's still high then um 
I would get it checked. The the one sort of I guess reassuring point is the actual um most common cause of um of high bilirubin is uh is actually uh, that at least that I see in practice um is is a genetic syndrome called Gilbert syndrome. And so you do get people that just have high bilirubin levels from that and it's not really well, it's not really a problem in conventional medicine. I would argue that you may want to still optimize your bile flow. Uh, but yeah, it's good to just get it checked out um, uh, to make sure it's not affecting other axes. And that syndrome causes that by reducing the effectiveness of bile flow, so it's still kind of related? So, um, so the, the, the gene um, controls an enzyme that helps break down bilirubin in, in your liver. And so, because to get bilirubin out of the system, I should probably have added that you need to conjugate it. That's why actually uh, often on your blood test results, you'll have the total bilirubin and you'll have the, um, the sort of conjugated and unconjugated. So you can then sort of see where the, where the issue is. So, uh, so you'd expect that because you're not able to really um, break it down, uh, you should, you would have a kind of unconjugated high levels of bilirubin. Okay, thank you, that makes sense. Okay, so let's go to ALP and ALT next. I know you kind of talked about them as a pair that you often look at together. Uh, just looking at my lab results here, I can see ALP, it gives a level below which it says it's not good, whereas, sorry, yeah, whereas ALT, it just says you know, the lower the better. Um, so what's your uh, experience on that? What's uh, optimal and what is uh, worrying? So with um, with the, um, I think uh, you may have meant AST, ALT usually go together in terms of like, those are specifically more related to the liver. Um, ALP, alkaline phosphatase, that's, that can be related to the liver or also uh, bone health. Um, and it's a little bit more. Of oh a, yeah, you're an, right. Yeah, a bit more of an. Uh, so let's start with. Yeah. Let's start with AST and ALT first. Yeah, you're right. Thank you. Uh, no, no problem. It's easily missed because they all sound. They all kind of sound the same. Um, but uh, um, you know, ALT, um, alanine aminotransferase, uh, and AST, aspartate aminotransferase. So, uh, you know, we when those are very out of range. Um, I'll say that kind of the normal levels are you want them to be you know below below sort of 35 40 it can really vary depending on which lab you use but somewhere around um uh, that you know below that in use per liter and generally this is one where uh we're more concerned if it's like multiples above that um so uh, just to kind of elaborate a little bit about the differences between the two um again uh ALT is more more frequently elevated with um, uh, viral infections, so sort of hepatitis, but other viruses that can affect the liver, um, some autoimmune conditions that affect the liver. Um, AST is more commonly elevated um, when there's been sort of toxic damage, particularly from alcohol, but other toxins. Um, and so Typically, if we see a high AST, often the first thing that a GP will ask you about is your alcohol intake. Um, so just, you know, if you happen to go to your GP and they ask you about it, they're not necessarily, let's say, stereotyping. It's just kind of what we're taught as, as doctors. But, um, you know, I see that raised actually very frequently in people who um, don't consume any alcohol. And then so we expect some sort of toxic damage there. Um, and if, if those levels are mildly elevated, sort of, you know, I would say less than twice the limit, so like less than 60, generally, uh, you know, we, we assume that there's been some virus, toxin, something, but if you can identify that, or if we, let's say, blame it on a viral infection, then we would expect those numbers to return back to normal within six weeks. So usually kind of the first protocol is just to recheck those numbers. Um, where I would be concerned is if they're sort of above double the limit. Um, again, sometimes it's still not that concerning. I would say, you know, for acute poisoning, acute liver failure, um, like for example, um, like in Eastern Europe where my family's from, every year in like the local toxicology department, you see people who get mushroom poisoning from like eating um, a dangerous mushroom in the forest. And then you get 
AST and ALT sort of in the thousands, so multiples above the reference range. That's when it's very dangerous. But it's something that I would wouldn't ignore um, from a from a functional perspective because it is, you know, as we mentioned before, an enzyme that's indicating liver damage. So really, anything above, I would say, thirty five, forty, you really want to kind of think about. Oh, is my liver like really struggling to detox? Could I could you know could toxins be a factor? Those sorts of questions. Could it ever be falsely too high? Because I remember uh, at one point I was trying to take high doses of alanine before bed because it's supposed to balance blood sugar throughout the night, and I think it was like ten or twenty grams. It was a lot of alanine, and then when I did my liver markers tested, it showed the ALT was really high. And then when I looked at it, it's like, well, alanine transferase, I wonder if it's just the alanine. And then I stopped taking the alanine and it just went right back. So is that possible? And also, is it possible with AST? Because aspartate is another amino acid that some people take. It's supposed to raise testosterone. So some people take it for that reason. Uh, could that cause a false negative or was it like a, a coincidence in my case? So it certainly could call um, could cause a, a false negative. Uh, I guess, though, you know, livers and um, proteins can be um difficult to to process so i would say like let's say if somebody is consuming a lot of amino acid supplements or an amino acids together theoretically if their liver is sluggish their detoxification pathways are sluggish you could still see those enzymes rising because the liver is struggling uh, you know but as you did where you just stopped taking them and then things returned back to normal, then I would definitely correlate that with those amino acids in particular, not that your liver was somehow struggling to just process amino acids in general. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. And let's go to uh, GGT, which uh, I think is your favorite for uh, assessing liver function out of the normal medical tests anyway. So uh, what are we looking at there in terms of uh, optimal and worrying? So there, um, you know, again, and unfortunately, it's one where sometimes you really have to ask your doctor to do. I found that sort of is not being included in your standard like liver function tests. Um, so, you know, I would, um, you know, I would maybe if you have the choice, just ask if that's being checked because it's like a little extra add on. I know in, in at least in, in the NHS. Um, but generally, like, you know, the normal range is around five to 40. And, um, but I like to see that sort of closer to the lower range. So like, I would say around 15 and below. Um, and that's one where if you are sort of approaching that upper level limit of normal, you know, like kind of in the mid thirties, then I would definitely be screening for again, alcohol, because that, that is a common toxin that can cause GGT to, to increase, but also other toxins. And that relates, you know, also to liver health, but also to bile duct health. So it's kind of on that, that part of the access, which um, we're looking at. And so um, the GGT is partly related to glutathione and inflammation, if I remember that correctly. Um, is that correct? Yes. So if you're, uh, you know, because you require a constant supply of glutathione and factors that uh, and other antioxidants that just help neutralize the inflammation that is kind of created through the detoxification process, uh, you need that constant supply to keep to keep the liver, the bile ducts healthy. So once the GGT is high, that is sort of a sign that that pathway might be not functioning optimally and where, you know, you might need extra phase two detoxification support, maybe more glutathione, also maybe things like um, taurine or uh, or choline or tutka. I mean, there are quite a few, but generally, yeah, that's kind of part of the treatment of what I, I look into when, when GGT is elevated. Mm, interesting. And are there other liver markers? Because we talked at the beginning about how these liver markers are not super sensitive uh, and that a person can have a fairly suboptimal liver and still maybe show up as even optimalish in these test results, which I think has been the case for me in the past. Um, so are there other markers that you'd like to look at? Um, I think, I'm not sure if we talked about HSCRP, for instance, maybe we can talk about that here. And uh, like glutathione, do you test glutathione or, and other other ones that you prefer, which you know you, you do regularly? Generally, um, I do like to get HSCRP um, as a marker of sort of low level chronic inflammation. Um, so, 
and not just for liver issues, but across the board, because inflammation is just such a um, important negative process. Well, not necessarily always negative, but a process that affects a lot of um, patients with chronic conditions. Uh, and unfortunately, HSCRP is one that is different is different than regular CRP or regular C-reactive protein. The HS uh, is high, high sensitive CRP. Um, and the, you know, the reference range is generally less than five, but optimally I really like to see that less than one. Yeah. I must admit when I see that, like mine is like always b below 0 0.30, which I think is the minimum. Um, and so if I see that raised, as you say, even one, one and a half, it still tells me the some level of systemic inflammation, which is significant because it seems to me that even if you're reasonably not inflamed, it just seems to be at the lowest level. And not just to me, I see it in a lot of people where it's just at the lowest level. Uh, so as soon as that's raised at all, I personally am like asking the person to investigate that further. Is that right? Or do you think I'm overreacting? No, no, I think you're you're completely right, and you know I think it's also worth noting that CRP um, very much correlates to one of your inflammatory cytokines, IL six, which you know is is a very important cytokine and generally is released to most stimul you know to to most kind of uh, stimuli, uh, but it's not the only cytokine. So you could theoretically have you know, low CRP meaning low interleukin six activity, but there can be other mark, you know, other cytokines that are also creating inflammation in the body, um, and um, and yeah, and I, I think you know what I, the 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 scenario I frequently see is people only have their CRP, uh, and that one is less than one. That is very sensitive, so. You know, and I feel like I often have these discussions with people where we, it's pretty clear that they have a lot of inflammation in the body. And I just say, like, look, e even if we do check your HSCRP and it and it looks like it's within normal limits, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're off the hook and, we, and you, that you won't benefit from any anti-inflammatory foods or supplements. You, you really need that constant supply because your body's constantly producing, you know, inflammation in response to the environment. Um, but of course, in terms of degrees, you know, we do like to see it at that level. And so I'm glad when I see that, but it's not kind of that they're off the hook. It's not definitive. And so we already talked last time about ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate is another mark of inflammation. O other than those two, let's say if they're both, you know, an optimal levels in the person, uh, is there any other markers that you would test uh, if, if you still see symptoms of inflammation, even if those are optimal? Um, I'd like to test, uh, so I, I often use something called an organic acid test, which is a, a urine test. Um, and there's a marker in there called um, 8-OHDG, um, 8-hydroxy-D-guanosine. I don't quite know the full abbreviation, but that is a marker of oxidative stress, like a cellular one. Um, and then I think also um, I like to use things like pyrrole, um, pyrrole counts. So, um, I don't know if it's worth kind of explaining what pyrrole is, but uh, pyrroles are... Um, yeah, but wait, both uh, of them. Let's let's explain yeah. both of them, please. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so so I would say with the um, the um, AOHDG, um, that essentially is a marker of um, DNA damage because what it's looking at is um, part of the DNA in the nuclei of cells is essentially like escaping out into the system. So those cells have lysed and have broken. And so, you know, you, you then know that if you're getting quite a lot of that in the urine, there is something that's causing a lot of cell cell damage and cell breakdown. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's definitely one where uh, I wouldn't say that I, I get everybody to do a year note test because it obviously look, it looks for um, many other markers. But um, if they can, then I, I do like to to check it, you know, check that 8-O-H-D-G. Um, and uh, there's an oat test. And sorry, also, um, I think I might be mixing the two up, um, but also when we look at like hormone detoxification, um, with things like Dutch tests, which are also a dried urine test, that also has that 8 OHDG marker, um, and uh, is you know is one that I think is uh, you know, um, very useful. 
Yeah, I can see that's actually included in my Nutravel as well, because of course that does include a lot of those organic acids. Um, and again, that's in a pretty optimal range. It looks like it's like free, uh, and I guess it's below 15 it's supposed to be. So um, does that mean then if, I, if all of those markers of mine are very optimal that I don't have systemic inflammation? Is that a good sign, or are there still other tests that could indicate that it's still there? Like the pyrroles one. In fact, I think we're waiting for my results on that one, right? So could you explain that one? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, so pyrroles are essentially a, um, a waste product that everybody produces. And um, some people, though, genetically produce more than others, but you also eliminate more pyrroles um, when your body's under a lot of stress. Um, pyrroles themselves relate to um, creatine metabolism. And um, I guess if we really want to go into... Um, into um kind of you know details of, of what what it actually does but it is involved kind of in um muscle breakdown and that whole kind of crap and cycle um but you know we're you know essentially looking for uh, so so actually when the pyrals are released um from the body um, they need to bind to certain cofactors for that pyrrole to become a cryptopyrrol that can then get eliminated in the urine um, and those cofactors include vitamins as b6 um, also zinc and quite a few of your fat soluble antioxidants so vitamins d a e um, and so the way that you then really kind of neutralize those pyrroles is really supply quite high doses of those nutrients um, and actually I guess on that note I do like to look at the levels of vitamin D in particular um, vitamins A and E are a little bit trickier to get on a blood test um, uh, and vitamin B6 is especially difficult to get on a blood test but um, there are some kind of urine markers to look at B6 status that I sometimes use but I like to look at those nutrients in general also in the context of inflammation Okay, very good. And so for liver function, is that like the main things that you would probably test? So, I mean, I guess the other, you can kind of go down a bit of a rabbit hole with testing, but I think once we start to figure out um, what might be causing the, let's say, inflammation in the liver, that's where you get into things like heavy metal panels, environmental toxins, um, viral panels to see if a certain virus could be affecting the liver. Um, I also like to run, um, there's something called a, um, yeah, a hepatic detox panel by Doctors Data that I run a lot. And that looks at um, certain markers that relate to phase one and phase two um, detoxification. So um, I believe the to see if I can get the sample report in front of me. The first, the phase one is looking at your D-glucaric acid, and that's um, that's a marker that um, elevates when it's exposed to a lot of uh, hepatotoxic uh, substances or chemicals. Um, and then phase two is um, looks at um, mercap um, mercapturic acids, which um, are also kind of related to xenobiotic exposure, but also, um, you know, a sign that actually you are using things like glutathione and other agents to really help get um, those those toxins out and kind of the phase two. Uh, but that's more of a kind of an advanced test that likely your GP wouldn't do, but you can often, you know, a lot of other um, integrative functional medicine doctors do that sort of testing. Interesting. All right. Well, we won't give worrying ranges for that because, as you say, you're probably not doing that without uh, a doctor, a functional medicine doctor, or something supervising you anyway. Um, but yeah, very interesting to know there's more things that we can test for if we want to get a more fine tuned idea of our liver function and inflammation, which, of course, are not the same, but they're definitely interrelated. Um, well, fantastic. Let's move on to another really important uh, organ, or I guess actually gland, that uh, is crucial determinant for long-term health, and that's the pancreas. So the pancreas, of course, we usually think of insulin, and that is the most important thing. Um, but, uh, you know, it's relation to blood sugar specifically. And then we'll talk about a couple of other things as well, like uh, the enzymes it produces. But let's start with the most common marker that you're likely to get in terms of pancreas function that pretty much uh, every doctor will do. And it's the 
Uh, I think in America they call it A1C, and over here we call it HbA1C. So um, could you please explain uh, what that means and why they test that one so regularly? Sure. So, so um, HbA1C is uh, essentially a marker of the um, percentage of hemoglobin, that blood um, protein um, to which sh sugar has bonded and um, and basically, it's it's basically a marker that there's been some glycation of that protein, um, and it's a marker looking at um, just your um, blood sugar levels um, over like the last three months. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, it what is the? Uh, let's start with the ranges on this one, actually. So, what's the optimal range, and what is the um, worrying level? This one again is a little bit debate. It can be can be debatable because uh, I would say that the the mark um, kind of the markers in conventional medicine are uh, a lot wider. Um, normally, um, you know, often I see something like um, four to um, to kind of six point three, um, and but I like. I like it to be a lot narrower. Um, I would say, you know, I guess the, the kind of important things to um, to note is that if it goes above 6.5, that's officially considered uh, diabetes and sort of 6 to 6.4% is pre-diabetes. So, pr you know, pretty much the, um, the GP will say that if you are in that range, um, then that's, that's okay. But obviously we, we, we would prefer yeah, less than that. <laughs> definitely not in the pre-diabetic range. Yeah, definitely. And I'm looking at my results because uh, I'm in the UK. It's very different. It's 20 to 42 is what it's showing. So um, is that similar? And is it really mid-range you want? Because, you know, you definitely, it's not a case of the lower the better, right? Because with blood sugar, you want a certain amount to give you energy throughout the day. So, uh, yeah, what's what's the, the kind of optimal level, would you say, you know, in, in both systems? So yeah, I forgot to say actually because I a lot, unfortunately a lot of the functional medicine tests I run end up going to America and so they're they're all American units. But yeah, in the UK, the diabetic. Okay. Most of our is... listeners are US, but I still know we have a few UK people. You know? <laughs> if if I was gonna say if it's um di diabetic range is typically forty eight millimoles from all and over, and then the, um the pre diabetic range is forty two to forty seven. And I know that sort of normal is considered less than 42. Um, now, um, if I, you know, I would say that you, yeah, you, you're, you're, you do expect to have some variation in your blood sugars over the day. That is normal. Because I think there's been a bit of a fixation about having, you know, no, no spikes in, in blood sugar. We don't want a spike, but we do expect there to be some, some range. I like to see it, um, yeah, kind of more around, you know, I'd say five, um, which I think, um, you know, 5% to millimoles is going to be, you know, somewhere around, uh, should be around, no, that is not a correct uh, measurement. Um, give me a second. Maybe 30, I have a calc like just mid, mid range? Mid range, pretty much, um, is what I've you know, what we would want. Um, and I guess one one other thing is because I, I do see a lot of people with low blood sugar and if you can theoretically have a high HbA1c because you have a lot of range but your blood sugars are going from very low to normal range and that might actually be more a sign of like adrenal depletion, POTS, you know, those sorts of characteristics. Uh, and that's sort of the type of person I wouldn't want to be on any sort of like blood sugar lowering agents. Um, so that's where it's useful to have other markers around that, like just even the total body glucose and um, you know, like a random blood glucose reading, because I could see, you know, I've seen a lot of, for example, like elderly women where they're put on medication and actually their fasting glucose and even their like postprandial. So after they've eaten their glucose isn't high, but they do suffer from low blood sugar. So. So that A1C can definitely be deceiving. So uh, I did an episode, you know, on insulin resistance previously, and I taught that, you know, way before a problem comes 
about with your A1C, a much earlier and more helpful marker is actually to look at fasting insulin. And the only reason that this isn't tested is because it costs, I believe, at least like more than 100 times as much as measuring blood glucose. It's like it's a way more expensive test. It's quite difficult to do. I think it requires like a radioactive isotope or something like that. So it's rarely done and you, you usually have to ask for it. Um, but that fasting insulin is actually a much more helpful early indicator of insulin resistance and pre-diabetes. So... Uh, please, could you give us your take on that? And is that something that you evaluate? And uh, yeah, definitely. And I, you know, I, you know, I like to tell people that often you'll see problems with insulin release, you know, seven to eight years before you can kind of even get into that like pre-diabetic range. Um, so it's very important and a very important marker of pancreatic function. Um, the kind of optimal range is debated a lot. Uh, I know that like on the blood test I use most commonly, the range is, is, is between like 2.6 and 25 um, micro use per mil. Um, but the optimal range is a lot lower than that. Um, I know some, um, most functional medicine doctors say somewhere, but like, you know, less than nine is, is good. Um, but I know that there are some you know, some actually quite well-known functional medicine doctors who even want that to be, um, you know, I would say, you know, like somebody, for example, like um, like Mark Kyman, I think he he aims for something like um, five and less, like two to five, um, which in my experience has been quite difficult to achieve, uh, in, like in my, in my patient population. But um, there is a little bit of this kind of, push that actually for a kind of optimal aging uh, and optimal metabolism actually the, the lower the better well yeah that was going to be my question because i think when i did my result it literally said below two like it, it didn't even give a marker and i was wondering if that too low um because obviously there is such a thing as too low right which is called diabetes technically there are at least some types of diabetes means you're not producing any insulin um so then I did another test after I ate and it was like 15 or something, which so that made me think that below two is probably fine. Is that was my thinking correct on that? Um, if it is extremely low, is it good to then test after eating postprandial to make sure that it's not, you know? Yes, I would say that's um, yeah, that's definitely a sign that it's not like pancreatic failure or something where you're just not producing um, enough. I mean, I think, you know, as well um the um post you know i'd say that uh yeah because it's tested so rarely it's it's actually one that like i haven't very commonly seen people have a post prandial insulin but yes you generally would then know that your pancreas is able of able to secrete it um if you weren't having any reaction then um you know it could be that the pancreas isn't working optimally um but also you know when you have um you know, when you have insulin resistance at some point, the, the pancreas is just not really, um, yeah, it, it eventually gets to the point where it's just not producing very, very much. Um, but um, yeah, it's an interesting kind of phenomenon to just, um, you know, because initially what you will have is you'll have normal insulin levels um, and then eventually there's just not that much secretion uh, and you'll just get progressively higher blood sugar levels um, and that's what we see in you know type 2 diabetes uh, some people like i think ben bickman who teaches about insulin resistance uh, i want to make sure i'm not misquoting him but i think from my understanding uh he said that you know really a lot of diabetes is not really a lack of at least sorry type 2 diabetes is not a lack of the pancreas being able to produce insulin it's actually is more just the resistance to insulin and so taking more insulin can work in the short to medium term because it's force you know it's forcing the sugar in with even more insulin but it's not really resolving the issue is that true from your clinical experience do you often see people with type 2 who actually do have quite high insulin in their blood yes exactly i um you see a lot of that and then uh, eventually what happens is you know the the kind of the overwhelming sugar just kind of overwhelms the the insulin release so you don't you, you kind of you tend to see that then drop but uh yes yeah, so you you see this this scenario of high insulin and then this resistance and that actually um, you know an interesting point is that uh, we know that for example certain 
like artificial sweeteners um, don't can also lead to a bit of a release of insulin and so that's why we now think that they're not so good because even though they're not theoretically raising your blood sugar they are still causing that insulin release um, uh, you know and which is not what we want Yes, I saw that about sugar um, and also saw when sugar is pumped directly into the stomach and the person didn't get a chance to taste it, then um, it, there was also a less of a, an insulin release. So it really is the taste of sweet that has the impact. It's very interesting. Um, so another uh, measurement that I talked about in my insulin release episode was HOMA IR, which is basically just um, fasting insulin times fasting glucose. To, and I think the idea is that you want that you know, score to be low, basically. You want both of those to be low, uh, or relatively low. You don't want your insulin to be very high, and you don't want your glucose to be very high if you've just not eaten overnight. I think that's the basic idea. Um, does that, is that make sense to you? Is that like a good indicator for people to do if they are checking themselves? It is, and I mean, I it's it's not one that I, I would say I, I, I calculate myself that often, but I know that if that is sort of less than one, that's generally a good sign. And if it's above 1.9 or 2, it's like early insulin resistance. So it's, you know, I think all of these calculators are, um, you know, are worth doing. The more data you have, the better. And I know that they've specifically like done studies on HOMA IR. And um, so, yeah, it's a good one to, to calculate. But usually one that you're sort of, yeah, you're using other markers to calculate it. It's not kind of an, an intrinsic marker that you're you're releasing like these others. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so those are the main f free to test for blood sugar. And so, you know, I would recommend fasting insulin as something to really ask for. And it sounds like you agree, uh, Dr. Miriam. Um, what about other aspects of pancreas function, like the uh, enzymes? So amylase and lipase is something that they um, sometimes check. I know what those are as digestive enzymes, but I don't, I'm not actually clear on what it means if they are in the blood or, you know, if it's high or low in the blood or whatever. So uh, why do doctors check that and what does it tell you? So it's a good question, actually, because I think some of the the methods of like how are they actually isolating it in the blood when it's released by the pancreas um you know we're, we're my what i think it, it what i think it's measuring is that just that if those pancreatic cells are like necrosing th those enzymes are being released into the bloodstream um uh, that's my understanding just like with like, the liver. Yeah, exactly um there might be something a bit more complicated than that that I'm unaware of, but essentially, the amylase and lipase are two of the most important enzymes, uh, you know, released by the pancreas. Um, amylase is also released by your salivary glands. So, um, you know, when I talk about digestive health, I always sort of say that like that actually enzyme release does start in the mouth, which is why, you know, like for example, chewing your foods properly and taking your time eating that helps to stimulate the release of amylase. So it is very important. Um, lipase, though, is, is slightly more sensitive for particularly pancreatic function. So you want those as low as possible within your blood, basically? Uh, is that the way it works? You still want them within a range, um, just because, again, if you are, um, you know, I think at, at, cer at a certain point, um, if your pancreas is really not working well and those enzymes of uh, those kind of cells of necrosed and gone, you won't have any enzyme production. But that's a very extreme example. That would be kind of, you know, someone who has sort of like a pancreatic failure. Um, uh, but you would, you know, so I think the reference range for amylase is around like 30 to 100 U per liter. And for lipase, it's it's um, it's a little bit less. It's like 15 to 60 uh, use per liter and you know typically I, I like to see them kind of on that lower end of normal like an amylase uh, sort of around you know 30 40 a light base um, you know around like 15 20 and that that's typically what I see in people where um, pancreatic function is okay and I would say that you you know once you see abnormal levels of those in the blood there's definitely a bigger problem and that's when I would like to then check um, check the levels in the stool. Like I like to use pancreatic elastase in the stool. Um, As a, so that, would you say that's a more mm, refined uh, way of assessing pancreatic function or is it just different? 
it's um it, it it will be a bit more sensitive in this in basically in the case that I see people where I think from a conventional medicine point of view they're going to be told nothing is wrong with their pancreas but we we can see evidence of fat malabsorption in what they're telling me and how they digest fats um, and how their stool looks and then it you know it's often confirmed by quite low levels of pancreatic pancreatic elastase on the stool test okay so that's potentially if you're still if you still think your pancreas is not functioning optimally despite having all the levels normal that's one you could definitely uh, consider uh, i just want to go back i think i actually missed uh with insulin and i was focused so much on it not being too low or could it be too low i forgot to ask you um what's the level at which a fasting insulin is concerning and a person should see a doctor it's an interesting question because you know generally if i see that insulin like above like 13 14 i'm already a bit worried about a degree of insulin resistance starting but i wouldn't necessarily refer them to the doctor because they would be told no that looks normal i mean it essentially i think once it's above that reference range so above 25 i i generally still you know as long as the you know i would say even if somebody is like pre-diabetic even in kind of the NHS guidelines, the first, um, you know, the first guideline will say, you know, you try lifestyle measures. So really change your diet, increase your exercise um, before starting metformin or uh, you know, any any other medication. So I would say that if somebody comes to me and they're feeling reasonably well, well, not necessarily well, but you know, they're functioning in their day to day, there is still quite a lot of room for intervention. And I um, and I find that you know, GPs really aren't kind of abiding by that first step. So uh, I know that they're apparently now they're referring uh, patients for a specific course to learn about nutrition, but I would argue that that might, some of that, their advice might not necessarily be the best. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily refer somebody um, unless, you know, I would correlate the insulin with the HbA1c. So it would really, because I, I would, you know, consider the insulin predating the HbA1c, um, I wouldn't really go on insulin alone to be referring somebody. The very rare case, if the insulin was like, you know, magnitudes of order above the reference range, you can have some very rare causes of high insulin, like insulinoma, a tumor, then of course you would want to refer. But if it's sort of mildly above the range and somebody suspects that there could be a degree of metabolic syndrome, you know, by their body shape, their lifestyle, then I think you you don't necessarily need to be going to your gp about it i think you could you it would be reasonable to change up your diet and lifestyle and then recheck in in sort of you know one or two months okay so high end of the reference range is definitely a cause for concern because it may indicate insulin resistance but it's not uh something to run to a doctor for because that's not really something they can help with it's something that you're going to want to work with either with a kind of functional medicine doctor or just by improving your lifestyle and diet the, the doctor will probably tell you otherwise. And I mean, I don't, you know, there are people who um, are on metformin and do well on it. Um, and I'm not going to sort of, I guess, um, criticize that because some people actually are able to do both. And then, um, but, you know, met, medications do come with more risk. So, you know, for example, somebody who's on metformin really has to watch out for um, B12 deficiencies, other B vitamin deficiencies, um, you know, also... Uh, some problems with pH balance, gut symptoms. So it's it's not really a walk in the park as it's sometimes portrayed. So we're focusing more on lab tests in these episodes rather than treatments. But as you mentioned it, metformin, what's your take on using berberine instead as a safer version that, you know, has a milder but similar action? Is that if a person is borderline, so they don't definitely need metformin, would you offer them uh, berberine as a you know, safer option? Definitely. I, I do like lo a lot of botanicals um, for helping to lower blood sugar. In general, generally, most of the herbs that are very bitter are good at um, kind of neutralizing that sugar. So um, I do use a lot of berberine. And the, the one issue with berberine is that it is, um, you know, something that's been used like in Chinese medicine for for thousands of years, but it is a very cold herb when you look at um, 
a kind of TCM herb profiles. And so if you use it long term, you can actually get uh, some uh, nausea with it and some sort of GI upset. So ideally, the formula you use should be balanced with some warming herbs, or at the very least, you should you know, have things like ginger, nutmeg, cinnamon. Cinnamon is actually also very good for lowering blood sugar and is a warming herb. So you just have to be conscious that it, it it's not it, it it might cause some side effects uh, if you're taking it unopposed for a long period of time. But berberine and cinnamon together are a good balance. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right, well, that's awesome. Let's next go to uh, cardiovascular health. And so in terms of blood test results and lab test results, usually the first thing that you're going to get to assess that is different forms of cholesterol, right? Um, now, that may not be the best thing to test. I guess that's we're going to get into talking about that, but it's the first thing that often that they will test and it you know, comes as a standard with most blood tests. Um, done by your doctor. So let's start with that. Let's start with cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and HDL cholesterol, which I think are the minimal that you know all three are usually included, like total cholesterol, LDL, and HDL. Um, could you please tell us, you know, what those mean? Why are they tested for? Um, and it, you know, if they're helpful, how are they helpful? Certainly. So. Um... Cholesterol, I think at its very uh, basic, is a um, very important, um, um, well, sterile that is, um, you know, makes up a very important part of our cell membrane um, and, you know, is essentially um, transported in um, throughout the body, like in, in the blood, uh, typically, um, you know, attached to a, a lipoprotein and those lipoproteins um, are, you know, essentially what you are measuring when you're measuring cholesterol. So if you have a low density, uh, like an LDL, low density lipoprotein versus an HDL. Um, but, you know, cholesterol is a it's a very demonized substance, but it's actually very important for, um, you know, as a precursor for developing all your hormones. Um, and, you know, it's also actually part of our response to, um, you know, to environmental pathogens and, and factors. So, um, you know, it, it's not it's not always something that you necessarily want to be just decreasing to a minimal level because, it, you know, it's, it's important for so many factors. Yeah, I think I've seen studies because my cholesterol was high for a long time and I saw studies saying that it being near the top of the reference range is actually protective for a lot of uh, things like Alzheimer's disease and various things as opposed to like people on the low end of the range of cholesterol are actually worse off in many respects. Is that true from your, um, in your experience? Um, I definitely find that those who have um, genetically slightly higher cholesterol, um, as long as you know, we're working on other inflammatory markers and also looking at things like homocysteine and those that are within range, um, they, you know, they don't, they don't have a problem with it. Saying that, um, it is very difficult to have a, an extremely low level of inflammation in the body. So, you know, I do get a bit worried if someone has, let's say a variant of familial hypercholesterolemia, um, where their levels are very high, uh, I'd like to use uh, not necessarily statins, but I do sometimes like to get that to a slightly lower range. Um, yeah. hmm. Well, just before we get into the other test you said, you mentioned homocysteine, we've got triglycerides and various other things. Um, let's just make sure we understand. So LDL is normally called the bad cholesterol. HDL is called the good cholesterol. Um, do you agree with that? And is it the case you want the HDL as high as possible, LDL, low as possible, or is there more to it than that? So, I mean, there's slightly more to it than that. I would say that HDL is definitely a good cholesterol, and you actually want that to be higher than a specific um, number. So, uh, you know, in the US, it's generally like over 60 milligrams per deciliter, and in the UK, it's usually, um, you know, it's usually sort of above one millimole per liter. And, and you're more worried if it kind of goes goes low because that is a protective um protective cholesterol and actually it, 
it's a protein that actually also helps with cholesterol breakdown and elimination. So to make sure that the cholesterol kind of completes the whole cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what's your take on this again, before we move on, because um, I've studied a lot about thyroid, as you know, and uh, my understanding is that, you know, 80, 100 years ago, something like that. Um, if you saw a person with high cholesterol, the first thing you would do, this is before the invention of statins and stuff, is put them on um, thyroid medication, probably a thyroid glandular back then. And that, so that high cholesterol, high blood cholesterol was like the number one markers for hypothyroidism and that very often increasing thyroid hormone would reduce cholesterol. And in fact, that has been my exact experience. My cholesterol was you know, above, slightly above the reference range, both the normal and LDL cholesterol was slightly above the reference range for the longest time. And then once we started optimizing my thyroid, it's just gone back to, you know, within the reference range, even though it's the high end. Um, so is that something you see maybe, I don't know, commonly, sometimes, occasionally? How, how common is that in your experience that just thyroid is uh, what a person needs? Uh, very common. I mean, I, I do see, I would say, a disproportionately um, large number of patients with some sort of thyroid issue, but I would say probably two thirds of them have higher cholesterol than um, than the reference range, so meaning like le over five, which is typically what the, the reference range in the UK is. Um, I would say that I'm comfortable seeing the cholesterol um, like sort of six and below um if it's above six I, I i don't like to really look at it in isolation i like to then look at um, not just ldl hdl but also the degree of oxidation of ldl um, how dense the ldl cholesterol is um, and other factors looking at like the vessel wall health but that usually requires slightly more specialist testing um, and also but i would say actually on that note most people will have their triglycerides checked and sort of what i always see in in, yeah. in hypothyroid that was the one i was going to ask about next sorry yes. that was the one i was going to ask about next because that's the fourth marker that you very commonly see on blood test results from like a normal doctor so uh yeah let's explain what triglycerides mean and sorry to interrupt no no no, no that's fine because i was i was going to say that that's um triglycerides are very important and uh you know they are um they're sort of more related to um the kind of fat you are getting, um, you know, through through food. Uh, so typically, if the triglycerides are low and the cholesterol is high, we we don't necessarily think it's because of um, because you're eating uh, too much uh, cholesterol, or even necessarily that you're um, eating too much um, like high glycemic foods that are then causing your liver to produce more. Um, you know, that to me, that's always kind of the first sign that. It, there might be a thyroid issue if the triglycerides are low or normal and the, the total cholesterol is high. Interesting. And that's exactly the case for me. Uh, my triglycerides are very low, almost at the bottom of the reference range. But as I said, the cholesterol is above the reference range. So that's a classic hypothyroidism pattern then from what you're saying. Because if you think about it from a, a hypothyroid perspective, you know, things are just sluggish. And um, really with hypothyroidism, it's an issue of fat clearance from the body. Hmm. And con conversion to the next step, right? So cholesterol gets turned into pregnenolone, pregnenolone gets turned into progesterone and DHEA and all of that stuff, right? That all starts with cholesterol. So that's my understanding is increasing that thyroid hormone increases that conversion into the stuff you actually want it to be, um, <laughs> rather than being stuck in your arteries. <laughs> Um, exactly. So for, so for triglycerides, it's interesting what you said about diet, because I do have a lot of saturated fat in my diet. My fat intake is almost exclusively saturated, although a lot of it is MCT oil, admittedly. Um, and, you know, a lot of my diet is fat. And then I actually have quite a lot of high glycemic carbohydrates as well, mainly in the form of starch. Uh, and yet my triglycerides are still, you know, extremely low. So is it more... I don't know, like the actual more unhealthy refined fats, like, I don't know, trans fats, like uh, seed oils and, uh, you know, refined sugars and stuff. Is that the stuff that raises, elevates triglycerides or does it just depend on the person? It depends on the, um, the, the person, but generally it does tend to be more from refined uh, carbohydrates, uh, very simple sugars, um, 
eat it. But, but certainly, like certain saturated fats uh, can lead to higher triglyceride levels. It it's interesting because uh, um, this is where genetics can often play a key a key role. Um, like for example, um, people with like an ApoE4 variant. Like if you've heard of ApoE4 um, and ApoE kind of in the context of Alzheimer's and cognitive uh, decline, uh, we know that actually your ApoE status can very much influence your triglyceride levels. So um, this is maybe going a little bit off topic, but like for example, people who are ApoE4 four and have both of those copies um, are more prone to actually having increased triglyceride levels even from healthy fats like from fish oils so you really have to dive a little bit into the genetics um, to see so um, you know I would venture to say that likely you don't have that issue if you're having a lot of saturated fats and your triglycerides are very low um, mm. yeah. and I see that in my genetics just to talk about you know a couple of weeks ago we did an episode with me and Chrissy where it said that saturated fats are good for me and then for her unsaturated fats are good for her and both of us that's what we eat I eat almost all saturated fats she eats almost all monounsaturated fats so you know it, as you say it is dependent part you know significantly on genetics and that is where genetics can be very helpful um, so just before we go to and I definitely do want to talk about all the other more interesting markers um, I've got a big list of them here and I know you do as well but just before that can we just go through the four basic ones that probably everyone will have access to and give them a um, like an optimal and a um, worrying level for those four yes so uh, I would say that yeah total cholesterol starting from that um, again like I like to that less than six if possible um but i probably wouldn't i wouldn't be referring um to you know for medical intervention unless that number is actually closer to like i'd say maybe eight and a half even nine in some perspectives because often if it is that high and that person hasn't had a cardiovascular event in previously there is a, a big genetic component um <sighs> You know, it can be, this is an area that's very much debated because, you know, they will say that, okay, like, let's say, um, you know, people like um, Eskimos or Inuits frequently have cholesterol, total cholesterol levels around nine, but they eat, um, you know, a very um, unprocessed diet. And so their vessel walls are all very healthy and they can handle that much cholesterol. But that's often not the case in most people living a modern life. Um, so once it gets sort of, kind of eight and a half nine i'd like to see um some medical intervention which doesn't have to be a statin um it can be something like a bile acid binding sequestrant or or even you know intensive do, uh quite higher doses of things like berberine um and and um you know and or red yeast rice although that does have still a bit of a statin side effect profile okay um yeah, very interesting. So uh, what about LDL? Uh, oh, sorry. No, let's go back. What's optimal for total cholesterol? Like, where, what's the level at which you're, like, perfect? I mean, I actually like to see it closer to the top of the range. I would say something like 4.5. Um, I get too concerned if it's, if it's low. Again, I see a lot of people with hormonal issues, burnout, fatigue, and I, I worry a lot about hormonal health. So, um, you know, whereas I don't see a lot of like acute MIs or, you know, people with, with cardiovascular disease. So, you know, um, take that with a grain of salt, but I'd like to see it sort of closer to the upper, upper level of uh, normal. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. 
To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. That makes sense. And as I said, based on the research I've seen, that is, you know, supported, uh, not just clinically. Yeah. Um, Okay. And LDL. So this might be a little bit different, right? So um, what's an optimal and worrying level for LDL cholesterol? I still like to see it um, less than two and a half. uh, I'd say maybe maybe less than three optimally, um, but still, you know, I'd say kind of between let's say between two and three. Um, But more important, I guess, is I'd like to see that in conjunction with the oxidized LDL, uh, which is the the amount of that LDL that is is oxidized. And uh, I I ideally like to see less than a third of the LDL oxidized. Okay. I don't think that's a marker I've ever had tested before. So that's a specialist one, presumably. Uh, Oxidized LDL. Okay. And uh, if someone doesn't have access to that market, is there anything else that helps get the, like give them an idea of that? Like, does the HSCRP indicate anything in that regard? Or exactly. So I mean, even things like the HbA1c, we know that that's glycated hemoglobin. You know, and LDL is oxidized. So there is like a almost think of there being either like a caramelized sugar group or like rusting on those molecules. So that's stuff that we don't really want. Um, but, but that that does signify a degree of inflammation. So there's other markers we spoke about, like uh, CRP. Uh, I think we potentially talked about mean platelet volume in the last podcast. Um, I would be looking at those uh, in terms of yeah, inflammatory markers. Awesome. Okay. And for LDL, what's the level which is worrying for you? So two to three is ideal. I would say this is one where if it is above above four, uh, I I like to push to get a more extensive cardiometabolic panel because when I see what I would consider worryingly high cardiometabolic panels, it's it actually usually is that cohort of patients who don't really want to see their doctor and don't really don't want to go on a statin. So, you know, so then I, you know, I just say like in order to do my job safely, I really need to know that you're not oxidizing all that LDL because that is a risk then. Um, you know, so it's, it's a tough question to answer because I have seen people with high LDLs, I would say kind of four, four and a half, uh, but they had a very low degree of oxidation and, um, you know, all of their metabolic, um, you know, markers, uh, things like, you know, insulin, homocysteine were all fine. And then I was okay with them not having any, any intervention there. Okay. Uh, okay. That makes sense. And then HDL. So this is one, it's supposed to be good. Uh, mine is pretty low in my blood test, but I think actually genetically it has a tendency to be low. So I don't know if that's an exception, but as you said, anything over one is considered okay. Mine is rarely any more than two. Um, so mine might not be optimal. What's an optimal level there? And then what's, I think you already said the worrying level is anything under one, right? Exactly. No, two is actually not that bad. I mean, I know the most common, um, UK test I run that the reference range is about one to 1.6. So, you know, but I would say that actually closer to two is, is, is better. You do want it slightly higher. And then that fits with, in general, having a little bit more cholesterol to then make your hormones. As long as we know that things like the thyroid are functioning well and the fat metabolism is okay, then yeah, I actually do like to see it closer to two. Okay. All right. So that's actually pretty good. And can it be too high? can be if it's also uh, if you then see that the ldl is too high because you what you often when you see high ldl um if the l if so when you see high hdl if you then look at the h the ldl and its magnitudes higher than the hdl then i'm just generally worried about um you know issues with fat metabolism and or thyroid issues so um again you kind of have to look at all of them together uh, but I'm 
I'm less worried about high HDL. Okay, but it's it, high HDL indicates that it's struggling to keep up with something if it's really high. Yeah, because ideally you then should be transporting the cholesterol, breaking it down. Um, you know, it should be incorporated actually into the cell membrane. So you're, you're not going to be holding on to that forever. So yeah, so that is kind of a, an issue with just transport. Mm, that makes sense. Okay. And then lastly, triglycerides. You know, I said mine are 0.3 near the bottom of the reference range. Can it be too low? Uh, and if so, what is optimal? And um, and what's worrying? I So, you know, the, generally we're looking for kind of a level below 2, even like 1.7, I, you know, I think is what um, the test I use. That's their reference range. But... Uh, I'm generally, I'm not concerned if the triglycerides are too low. Um, I wouldn't sort of ever be like referring somebody for intervention if it was too low, but then um, I would just sort of also screen for, is somebody really limiting the fats in their diet? And maybe that might not be the best idea. Um, hmm. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, but generally not too concerned. No. And what's uh, too high? What's worryingly high? Like you should see a doctor if it's this level. And there are uh, there are um, some genetic conditions where your triglycerides are very high, um, but I want to say that is um, you know that is sort of two or three times the upper limit. Um, so there is like fi familial hypertriglyceridemia, um, but I want to say that. You know that I would be I would refer kind of only in that sort of circumstance where I think there's a very strong genetic predisposition. Um, so I would say that it would have to be probably a three and above for me to be concerned. Okay, all right, fair enough. That's that's very helpful. And I know that there's a quite a famous cardio doctor who says that you know cholesterol markers are not important uh, except for the only thing he looks at is the ratio of hdl to triglycerides um and he wants you know the i can't remember the exact numbers he gives but he wants the hdl to be as high as possible in relation to triglyceride and that's the most important thing um when it comes to heart health what's your opinion on that particular take from from you know your clinical experience I wouldn't say that those were necessarily the most important. I, again, I really like to look at all the markers together. And I would say that from a systemic point of view, I'm again, more worried about like the level of inflammation, oxidation. Um, but, you know, I'd say that it's still a reasonable marker. You know, we generally want good HDL, high HDL levels and, and lower triglycerides, but not too low. Uh, I guess, you know, the... I know that you know when I studied HDL to triglyceride ratio, you 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 know you want it less than two, but then you could argue that actually, if your triglycerides are, um, you know, well, no, actually, hang on, I'm. <laughs> I think I was going to say if your triglycerides are too low, yeah, that would that would drive the number higher. So actually, it would make sense. Um, but I'm just thinking like these sorts of markers, I. I'm not a huge fan of these ratios because I just think there can be some so much variability. Um, you know, like for example, if the HDL is um you know reasonably good, but somebody has what I would say two low triglycerides, I wouldn't necessarily say that that is a very bad thing that needs medical referral. So I probably wouldn't use it as the predominant marker. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, you know, whenever I hear things like that, I think they probably are oversimplified. So you've talked a lot about the cardio metabolic panel, and um, what are so what are some of your favourite uh, heart cardiovascular health markers? And we've talked about the common ones. What are the ones you've mentioned oxidized uh, LDL, and you've really told us you want that below a third, um, and we've explained that what that is. So yeah, what other markers do you like to look at? I mean, on that same note, things like uh, small dense LDL cholesterol. So that's um, you've, you know, very as the name is very dense cholesterol. That is more likely to kind of stick in the arteries and cause a blockage as opposed to kind of bigger, fluffier LDL uh, molecules that can be kind of 
squished around and you could still get blood flow around it. So that's a marker that I would really like to look for. And um, on the test I use, I know that you ideally want that to be kind of less than 35. Um, I also like to look at um, uh, lipoprotein A. Um, and I mean, there's there's quite a few homocysteine. I don't, is it worth kind of going through? Let's let's explain those two. Yes, yeah, so we've done a, we've done VLDL. I have them on my list anyway. Let's explain definitely VLDL, lipoprotein A, and homocysteine, please. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, lipoprotein A is 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 also a um a you know a protein that carries um uh, cholesterol through the blood, and you know, and um, it is generally associated with an increased risk for um, cardiovascular events. Um, and that particular lipoprotein A bound to a cholesterol is, is more likely to kind of um, deposit itself on your vessel walls. And, you know, and uh, so essentially it's quite uh, important for clotting and plaque formation. And also, um, you know, lipoprotein A is inflammatory, so it increases the the likelihood that that plaque that's formed from that growth kind of on the wall is more likely to to rupture. Uh, so it's you know, and and I think there are also some isolated studies that it on its own is a very good factor for determining future cardiovascular risk. Yes, I've heard that's a really good one. I haven't tested it because all my it doesn't seem to my issue, be my issue cardiovascular health, but if I was at all concerned about it, I would be uh, springing for that one, definitely. And another one that is very helpful um, is homocysteine, right? Um, partly because it's so uh, predictive of all kinds of um, diseases, including cardiovascular. And second of all, because it's so easy to resolve. So, um, and I do see homocysteine. It's not very common in the UK with a standard doctor test, but I see quite a few people's blood tests in the US that are standard where homocysteine is included. So I think this will be useful for a lot of people. So could you tell us a bit about that one? Sure. So, so homocysteine, uh, again, yeah, I really like to measure this one. Um, it's it, homocysteine is basically, um, an amino acid, um, and, uh, it's part of your methylation cycle. Um, and you need quite a few um, cofactors to break down homocysteine and then you know that allows that methylation cycle to kind of to continue but we know that homocysteine on its own um can actually da damage the lining of your uh, blood vessels uh, and uh, in other things as well you know for example high homocysteine levels also just prevent the proper kind of formation of serotonin and dopamine. So it can also be very instrumental in looking at uh, mood and mental health. Um, but from just purely the context of cardiovascular health, uh, it's something that you, know, you want to see low and, um, and to help lower it, essentially you just treat by giving those cofactors that help to break homocysteine down. Which is usually B vitamins and sometimes methyl donors, uh, which are all cheap and easy to get and side effect free, mainly, right? So, yeah, well, I would say uh, B, B, vitamin B6 definitely. Uh, B6 is actually, I would say, one of more more problematic supplements because unfortunately it can cause nausea in a lot of people. So, um, I sometimes use like activated B6, so P5P. Um, it's, yeah, it's a complicated one, but generally, like, not dangerous to give and one that you can you can obviously mitigate those side effects or um work out like different times of day to take it but yeah b6 l-serine betaine tmg um there are some others then if like those don't get the homocysteine down but they normally do yeah so you said as low as possible i think is the reference range usually 5 to 12 or something like that 5 to 10 5 to 11 it's something like five to 12. Um, I like to see it less than seven though, if possible. And can Especially, it ever be too low? Because I think my- Yeah, it can't be too low. I think my one is 4.8. 4. So that's not like a, a worry. So the lower, the better. I would say generally the lower, the lower, the better. And, um, one that I think, especially in the context of mood and mental health, uh, you want it to be lower than seven. Hmm. Which is, as you say, not particularly easy to get to always, right? But that's that's the goal. 
if you are actually giving other methyl factors like um, B12, SAMe, um, methionine, that can actually increase your homocysteine if you're not um, first trying to get the homocysteine down. So it has to be done in that order if you're trying to improve methylation. Mm. I'm a fan of choline and creatine for that as well um, because it provides methyl donors. Uh, so uh, that's a strategy that worked for me for if anyone's struggling. Um, so interesting. Okay, fantastic. That's homocysteine. Um, and so any other that you consider important cardiovascular uh, markers? So I also like to check... Um, I think to be fair, we've gone up through most of them. Um, I mean, I'm just generally thinking of other metabolic markers like, um, you know, like leptin, but that's, I'd say, maybe more metabolic than cardio. Um, well, funnily like... enough, I was going to ask about leptin. I was actually going to ask about leptin last because there is a doctor whose work I'm kind of intrigued by who uh, claims that leptin... So some people, like me, say that thyroid is kind of the root of a lot of health issues. A lot of people say that like insulin and insulin resistance is the root of a lot of health issues. But this doctor says that actually leptin and leptin sensitivity is at the root of a lot of health issues. Um, and so that intrigued me. So I don't know a lot about leptin. I know it is the um, satiation hormone as opposed to ghrelin, the hunger hormone, um, by... You know, other than looking at this person's work, I didn't before that have any kind of idea about leptin before that. And so I'm interested to hear that it's, uh, as you say, a met metabolic health marker that you look at as well. So uh, what context are you looking at it in? What is it telling you? And I guess, yeah, what's a good level? Uh, so, you know, just to explain, so leptin is a, um, a hormone that your um, adipose tissue or body fat releases um, that uh, is very important for maintaining a normal weight and also making you feel full. Um, and, you know, we think that um, kind of also its, it's function is just to regulate your body's food intake with, you know, with energy use. Uh, but, you know, you know, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical because I know it's being blamed for okay this is why everybody is why so many people are struggling with their weight um but i just and you know i think as the future goes on we're gonna maybe learn that you know certain toxins and uh certain things will be responsible for messing up that leptin sensitivity um you know but we're yeah so i'm not sure it's kind of the be all end all i think that I think that actually the much more basic things are responsible for um, for health issues like, you know, the inflammation that cascade and that kind of balance between your immune system and the inflammatory cascade that is important for a lot of conditions. Um, but, we, you know, I'm sure we, we could get into that. Um, but, well, you know, I, uh, yeah. And so what causes that? Is is it toxins? I mean, that's and that goes back to a question I wanted to ask originally. Let's see if they could go together, like with cholesterol and the in the arteries, one of the things that I learned is that often, while it may not be great, because of course, as you say, it can build up to a level where it's dangerous, especially if it's certain types and all the rest of it, that it's uh, actually your body's response to toxins in the blood, like it's trying to protect the lining of the arteries, the walls of the arteries, maybe it's you know, trying to actually create a protective barrier, maybe the clots, which also ultimately lead to cardiovascular events, are there to like try and heal uh, damage which is done by corrosive elements in the blood so I guess the question I'm asking is first of all what do you think of that theory and second of all do you think that toxins are more likely a root cause of a lot of these um, health issues I would say the yeah exactly the, like I I think that if we that's a good way to answer this um, I think if we look at problems with uh, obesity and metabolic syndrome now compared to 50 years ago you know we've not necessarily seen an introduction of like new types uh, as in like you know new food groups um but we have seen a lot more toxins being added into things um we've also seen um yeah like different sorts of medications you know other things that i i would say that 50 years ago we weren't exposed to and you know we've always had people who've struggled with obesity but I think to this degree you know they're 
to me is just something that is affecting that hormonal balance. And, um, you know, I would say that, you know, it, it's, it's quite shocking nowadays, you know, where, you know, where my, my parents, um, uh, live in sort of central, um, the United States and Tennessee. And I know that whenever I go there and I, you know, go to like a, I'm at the airport, you'll see obesity, but you'll, you'll see that there's definitely a big hormonal link to it where like, you know, um, it just looks like a sort of different manifestation, whereas there are definitely different toxic mechanisms involved there. Um, not just kind of your average putting on weight. So I just, I, I'm convinced that it's something that is, is related to, you know, the types of toxins, even let's say, I mean, viral infections and things, um, you know, maybe things that we've been putting in our bodies to help us fight off, like, um, certain infections might then be backfiring with a kind of our overall immune defense. So it's, um, it's a complicated topic, but I think it's, it's, I think a lot of the chronic disease is kind of secondary to, to more the environmental factors that are coming in. And even our, our immune system, maybe not being able to mount a defense because it's having to fight off so many different things, but if that makes sense. Yeah, it does very diplomatically uh, and carefully stated there. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I would say also, just to go back to what you said about diet, I mean, the one thing that has shifted in the last 50 years significantly is the proportion of seed oils used, right? Because about 100 years ago, people were, as you said, there was hardly any obesity. People were consuming loads of sugar 100 years ago. They were consuming loads of fat and cholesterol 100 years ago but they were not having a lot of seed oils and perhaps also they weren't having a lot of other things like high fructose corn syrup. So other than actual chemicals and additives in the food, in terms of like major sources of macronutrients and sources of calories, I'd say those are the two biggest shifts, maybe the seed oils and then the um, high fructose corn syrup. Uh, do you think those are significant factors? Yeah, exactly. And I think that also ties into what we're talking about with oxidation, like oxidated oils are just not good. And so, uh, you know, that can lead to a big raise in your inflammatory markers and your cardiovascular risk factors. And we know, I mean, even kind of traditional sources of fat that have been demonized, like, um, you know, like lard, for example, actually, it doesn't, it, it takes, uh, it, it doesn't oxidize well. So in a sense, like, whereas a seed oil might, I mean, there are exceptions, like, for example, avocado oil uh, also has a very high oxidation point. But if you think about, if you look at most labels, just the amount of seed oils in typically when there is a lot of processing, there's a lot of heat involved. So that in and of itself just introduces a lot of oxidative stress in the body. Yeah, there's a lot of processing that goes to making a sunflower or a soy oil or a canola oil. That is part of the problem. But I agree, it's not universal. I mean, coconut is a seed, macadamia is a seed, and both of those are very resistant to oxidization. So it is case by case basis. Uh, well, fantastic. So we talked about, you know, major important organs. We talked about the liver pancreas, technically gland, <laughs> and the heart and cardiovascular system. Um, is there anything that you want to add on uh, like those subjects before we finish here, Dr. Miriam? Uh, I just wanted to quickly go back to uh, leptin and leptin resistance, because I don't think I ever gave you um, a, oh, yeah, a marker. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, but generally, you know, we're seeing, um, we're typically seeing higher and higher leptin levels and basically the, a form of what we call leptin resistance, similar to insulin resistance, where, um, you know, so I would say the reference range that I use is somewhere between like four and, um, and 39, like, um, uh, n grams per mil i think it's on my sample report that i use and but i'm i'm frequently seeing it sort of in the 30s which is concerning to me i like to see that um you know i like to see that much lower um so you know somewhere you know between you know i would say like 12 and um and lower ideally uh and if it's getting much higher than that to me is a sign that the body's producing leptin and then you're not really becoming satiated and that whole access is um is not working and I, I think you know this is a bigger debate but you know is it the case that some of these foods just mess with that whole mechanism and you just don't have that release and so people are eating and eating and not really getting that fullness that they that they should 
And a lot of people are talking about light exposure in relating to leptin and that it's the excess of blue light throughout the day and especially more, you know, throughout the night that messes with leptin regulation. Have you heard that? And do you think there's any credence to that? I, I've definitely heard of the studies where I know that, um, you know, red light is supposed to increase leptin levels. Uh, it's not something I know a whole lot about, but I, I definitely think that um, it makes a lot of sense. I certainly know that um, people who tend to work night shifts often struggle with their uh, metabolically more so than kind of uh, other um, groups of people I've worked with. Um, you know, myself included, I know when I had to do a lot of night shifts um, in the hospital, you know, I would sort of say, well, I'm actually not eating very much. And um, like, I, I think it becomes more difficult to kind of to control your weight. Um, uh, but so I think there's definitely something to it. I'd probably have to look a little bit more into the, the papers there. But, um, you know, certainly I bet there's there's they're going to show us that light exposure and being out doors um it you know is, is actually very important for all of your hormonal regulation vitamin d after all is a fat soluble vitamin that's very much important for optimal hormone um so i wouldn't be surprised if then they kind of were correlating those two interesting well the point of these episodes has to be get to go to through lab markers mainly and give people guidance on what they mean as opposed to giving any kind of advice uh but to finish and i realize it's putting you on the spot and it's a very broad question but is there any kind of advice that either you think is the most important or you think that's the most overlooked that you would like to you know give people on this uh, on this subject of metabolic health before we finish it um I would say, yeah, so, <laughs> there's so much there, but uh, I would definitely, I know. you know, I would definitely say that um, a lot of these markers are also affected by um, by stress. So I think we didn't really touch into this, but like the impacts of cortisol with blood sugar and and then insulin. Um, so I would say that, you know, it, you know, it's 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 nothing new, but just that working on your stress levels and your reactions to things um, and making sure that you're kind of working on nervous system health is very important for metabolic health. Because uh, I think people people know about diet, even though there's a lot of theory about what's the optimal diet, but you know, essentially like cutting out processed foods, simple sugars, and also um, exercising. I think um, that is pretty well known, but just the impacts of stress and what about metabolic health and just having some sort of a routine, even if it's a very small one, um, breathing exercises, ways of relaxing that you're really trying to incorporate in the day. Hmm. Fantastic. Yeah, you're right. Very important. Okay, well, thank you so much. Now, as I said, that was very on the spot, like quick advice. But obviously, you know, that's why people come to see you is to get much more in depth analysis and then a detailed advice. I know every client you have, you do like a detailed written report of recommendations, as well as in the UK and the uh, Europe, you can do prescriptions for them. Uh, you do consulting for people the rest of the world. Um, uh, so if people are interested in finding out more about you and uh, potentially utilizing your services, where should they go? Yes. So, yeah, just to note on that entire topic, um, the kind of optimal ranges I give, that needs to be personalized. So if you, if, you know, if one of my patients happens to, to listen and they're like, that's not what you told me, it's because it really can be very individual. Um, but uh, yes, if somebody would like to reach me, um, you know, they could certainly find me through my clinic website. So it's just uh, Mikitsuki Medical. Um, so either through um, through the site, through Instagram or on Facebook, um, you can just find me there. Um, and yeah, and just I always um, offer a, a sort of a free intro call, um, you know, to to understand your your situation so um yeah happy to chat to anyone who thinks they could use some help fantastic and that's m i c uh, m i k i c k i medical.com is that right yeah. yes everyone always tries to put a c but yeah there's no c until the end so yes k, k m i k i c k i <laughs> m i k I say key, uh, medical .com. I say that, you know, not everyone's watching. Some people are listening. Um, so, yeah, you can type that into your phone. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for your time. 
Uh, Dr. Miriam, uh, I know we've got another episode probably coming out after this, which you did with Chrissy, where you go through uh, female hormones, which is really interesting. Um, and I'm looking forward to watching that myself because I've freely admitted I'm not an expert on that and happy to learn about that. And I uh, hopefully we can do other episodes in the future, maybe talking about different tests, like not maybe the medical tests, but um, tests that are more interesting to you that you <laughs> that you run more regularly, um, like organic acids tests you mentioned, cardio metabolic profile, maybe stuff like that. Um, we can talk about uh, like understanding those kind of tests and maybe all kinds of other things. We'll see. But for now, we very much appreciate your time. Is there anything you'd like to uh, say before we finish? Um, no, just, well, thank you very much for having me. And, um, yes, just to kind of add on to that, certainly would be happy to go through kind of some of the tests that I use, um, because nowadays actually, uh, you know, it's always good to go through those things with a practitioner, but, uh, uh, you know, things like gut microbiome testing is being, is now almost readily available to the public. So, um, you know, in case you want to just learn a little, a little bit more about that, certainly would be happy to help. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I'd recommend Dr. Miriam. She's, uh, you know, associated with uh, Genetic Insights. Everyone who um, requires medical support beyond, you know, a simple consultation, I will tend to refer to uh, Dr. Miriam, unless there's a good reason geographically not to. So um, uh, I, you know, give her my highest endorsement and I uh, recommend that because the reason why I'm so happy to find you and to partner you in this way Dr. Miriam is because I kept seeing comments um, underneath the videos when I would give advice about I don't know hormones or various other things like my doctor won't do this there's no doctors out there who do this and so I was like first of all yes there are they do exist um, Dr. Miriam is one of them and she is happy to have work on optimizing she's not the type of doctor who's going to wait until you're you know, who has to be almost dead before they're interested. She's someone who is genuinely interested in helping you to be the best version of yourself that you can be. Definitely. And I would say even that that field that I work in more uh, functional integrative medicine, um, you know, most doctors are sort of trained to look more into root causes, but also to kind of help you optimize before you're kind of, you know, hanging off a cliff type of sick. Um, and that's, you know, that um, it, you can also look through the um, Institute of Functional Medicine's practitioner database. Um, that's where I certified, but you can also, you know, find someone who's, who's local to you. And I would say most of those um, doctors do offer sort of support calls um, at the beginning, because I know it's very important to sort of find somebody that you click with and kind of like their style of consulting. So um, I would always highly recommend doing that and trying to trying to um, uh, like do a bit of research there. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Miriam. And remember, please support the podcast by um, as well checking out Dr. Miriam, checking out geneticinsights.co, feelyounger.net. Um, and please like, subscribe. And if you're listening on Spotify, give us a star rating. If you're listening on Apple, give us a star rating and uh, please a review. We could do a few more of those. Uh, thank you and see you next time. Thank you. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I recommend is just here, if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below, if you want to click on that one and watch that next.